Hello, this is an open reel audio tape. You know, it's a common misconception that the spinning of the spools pulls a tape through, but of course, anybody who's worked on this equipment knows better that you actually have a pinch roller which pulls the tape through against the capstan at a fixed speed. So the tape motion is at a fixed speed, even as the spools start off quick as they're empty and slow as they're full. So all the real motors have to do is pull the slack tape through after it's been fed past the pinch roller. And that's a given that all tape recorders are built that way. It would be stupid to build them any other way because you'd have problems with irregular speed. If you were to drive just the spool, well, two things. One, you wouldn't get very good wear and flutter performance because the spool can wobble around, the amount of tape on the pack can slide. It's not good. But the other problem you'd have is if the tape was ever spliced and put somewhere else in another part of the tape, it'd run at the wrong speed. So we understand that all tape recorders have a pinch roller and run at constant speed, except they don't. Because on occasion, I've had some audio tapes slightly smaller than that in a kind of a plastic cassette cartridge type thing. And when I've taken them out of the cartridge, their normal spools, put them in a tape recorder which has a pinch roller, as a normal tape recorder would, I find that the speed is odd, that the beginning of the tape and the end of the tape are running at different speeds. And of course, it's not a stepped thing. It's not something you could change in audacity. It's a linear shift, may not even be that linear, shift in speed throughout the process of the tape moving. There may be software tools to help with that, but of course you don't have any fixed um, reference to set the speed up with. So really, that kind of tape needs uh, the same kind of machine that recorded it. But I've never actually come across any such tape recorder. Special delivery. Oh, right. Let's have a look at this then. Right, so here's a tape recorder which may be built differently. Let's open it up and have a look. Old and not in the best condition, but let's see what we have. Well, it's made by Philips, so it should be half decent, shouldn't it? So what do we have? Play, fast forward, rewind and record. Volume control there, and I have no idea what that is. Uh, no, that just spins round and round. I wonder what that control does. It's marked zero to 20. Hmm, maybe that's a speed control of some sort. And how do we get the tape out? Oh, this is the strangest thing. I was not expecting this at all. So this is somehow fed through here and attached to that spool. This is not what I was expecting. I've seen something before where you get a whole clear cassette that mounts on the machine. But this is some sort of auto-loading affair where that will feed through and be automatically loaded on the spool. So my question is, does this have a pinch roller or is it spool driven? If it has a pinch roller, then this tape could probably just be run on a normal tape recorder. If it doesn't, then it needs to go on this. Well, we have access to the head assembly here, so let's take this off. This is a pinch roller driven unit. This is not what I was expecting. There's a pinch roller. Okay, so not what I was expecting. These are not standard spools either, and I suspect, in fact I'm sure, that would not fit on a normal tape recorder. Oh, what's the tape width? The tape seems to be mounted back to front. I 
can't work this out at all. Oh, it's been chewed up inside the housing. Let's unjam that. Wait, is that normal quarter inch tape? Power it to normal quarter inch tape. No, it's narrower, but it's not half. So it wouldn't be possible to play this on a cassette deck because it's the wrong width and it wouldn't be possible to play on a normal tape recorder. So we are in a position of, if we wish to, re wish to recover this tape, we have to use this machine for it. Interesting. A model number for this obscure little thing. EL3583. Is it can run on batteries. So you would stack six uh, C size batteries, I think, in there. But we'll try to run it on a mains adapter. And we have two sockets, one labelled M and one labelled, well, that's DC input. So uh, that's where we'll connect a power supply of some sort. Do that now, I think. Okay, take it apart. Oh, schematics, that's useful. Just an idea of the vintage of it. Uh, we're looking at AC128 transistors, so germanium transistors. At itself, there's a big motor here with no drive belt on it. So what would be even more useful, perhaps, than a schematic would have been a layout of the drive belt, because it's not obvious. So interestingly, it does not appear to have a speaker. Oh, that's um, interesting. So we're going to have to pick up the audio from uh, that DIN socket at the side. I've just run this motor by hand a bit and it seems a lot smoother and happier now. But, oh, what a nuisance that we don't have the, uh, the belt layout because the motor's mounted that way and the capstan's that way and somebody's got an elastic band in there. Well, that's never going to work, is it? So we need to get this apart and work out what drive belt it should have and where it should go. Look at the PCB and see if we can work out the pinout for the DC socket, which is this one. Or well, it may be obvious from the schematics. Or oh, indeed the volt will be 9 volt, so we can safely run it on 9 volt DC, can't we? Okay, there's more elastic band carry on in here. Work out where the belt goes. Or belts. Work out. We know that this is the capstan here. And if I select fast forward... and turn the capstan that way, clockwise as I'm looking at it, the spool, take-up spool, works in the fast-forward direction. That must be stopped then. And if I hit rewind, uh, presumably this then, the rewind, has to have a belt. So we know now that the fast forward is done from the capstan via a drive of one of these pulleys, one of these rollers. Uh, so there's nothing to do with that. That's working fine. Fast forward and presumably play. Let's press play. And yes, it rotates on play as well. So I need to provide a belt from the motor to the capstan. And then, or maybe the same belt, also to the rewind system, which must, this is odd, because it must be something that engages when you press rewind. Let's have a look at rewind. When I press rewind, this pulley engages with the capstan. So there must be a drive belt from that pulley to that uh, supply spool and also from the motor to the capstan but that's a little bit weird because the motor is mounted sideways and there's also this pulley here that seems to be free to slide up and down 
its shaft. So uh, I'm going to have to work out exactly how that motor connects to the capstan and then this should be a straightforward small belt. That should be straightforward. Let's do that one first, I think. Belt there for the uh, take-up spool. Okay, I have a belt in there. Maybe a little tight, but we'll roll with that for the time being. So that's the uh, take-up spool sorted for now. So we need this belt from here via this to the capstan. That's the weird one. Also a bit awkward. I'm going to have to um, get this off the top of the capstan flywheel in order to fit the belt. That's a bit of a nuisance. There's enough slack in there, maybe. OK, well, I've put the belt on. I don't know. This belt, again, may be a little bit on the tight side. But you've got this pulley here, which is about right. And we'll know if we've installed the belt the right way round if, when I'm rotating this pulley in the direction that the capstan needs to go in, which way, I think, looking at where the capstan's mounted, if, when I select fast forward, it goes in the right direction. That's fast forward. Then try play. Yep. Yeah. And the pinch roller is rotating in the correct direction. And rewind. And that's running in the correct direction. Not a lot of torque on rewind there. It's very low on torque. So there could be an issue. Why is there not enough torque? because of this drive surface here, I think. So I'll roughen that a little bit, maybe let it see a little bit of um, pin, uh, roller restorer. It's unclean, uh, which is intended for printer rollers, uh, can come in handy for rejuvenating a rubber surface like this. Let's see if now we have more take-up torque. Uh, not much, to be honest. Surface that it um, drives against as well. Well, it's a bit better than it was, but it's still not very good. It may improve just with a little bit of use, because this rubber's obviously not been used for a long time. That's good enough for now if I need to rewind the tape. Yes, that's definitely good enough to rewind the tape. All right, um, so our biggest problem is going to be powering up, but then there's also whatever state these ancient capacitors will be in, and there's also a big record play switch, which we probably should give some switch cleaner to. So there's a big record play switch there. Um, capacitors of this vintage don't so much go high ESR, they go internally leaky. So uh, that could be an issue. We could end up, well, there's not a huge amount of capacitors, but it would certainly take some time to take it all apart and change them. That wouldn't be much fun. Let's hope I don't have to. OK, so I've exercised that switch. This control here, I'm not sure if that's got any connection to this well, it looks like a drive pulley here. What's that? I have no idea why there's a small drive pulley there and not obviously anything for it to be driven from. Ah, I think it takes a drive belt over to the supply spool. OK, we will... Um, connect a drive belt to that. I'll just make sure these switches are in good order. Right, so we need a drive belt from that pulley to the bottom of the supply spool. Quite a long belt, that one. 
Glad I spotted that. It may not be essential, that one, but let's see. Tricky, that one, because it has to go under this bracket. I'll get you set up so you can see this slightly better. So this belt is now under this bracket, and I'm hoping I can fit it to that plastic pulley. Now I can refit the one I had to remove just now. Right, let's check in Rewind that it has enough torque to turn this, whatever it is, auxiliary belt contraption over here. No, it doesn't. The extra load of this belt and this pulley. Oh, hang on, it's jammed. No, it still doesn't. <laughs> This is this definitely uh, extra load on the rewind system here. So it's struggling to, as this rotates, it's struggling to rotate the take a, a supply spool because of the extra load of this belt. Let's try and roughen the surface of this slightly. We've done it. So now, when this is in in rewind mode, the rewind is turning, and so is this auxiliary belt uh, belt and pulley for whatever function it has. Right, we can roll with that. Assemble this PCB. Being careful to put this switch um, engagement pull thing over there clean the heads, although that might be a bit optimistic at this point, we're nowhere near actually getting any audio from this thing. And the capstan, which I can rotate by hand. And if we put it into play, we can clean the pinch roller too. Looking at the terminals here, trying to work out what the polarity is. Looks like this is positive. Positive is the grey wire and negative is the red wire. Excuse me, Phillips, what are you trying to do here? Is any sense looking at the schematic here? We think this is negative, but it goes through a switch. So nothing happens until probably play is pressed. It appears that the value, according to the schematics, the value of R35 there depends what the voltage of the motor is. So there's obviously several different types of motor that could be fitted. Now, I think that means it's dated 1964. Is that possible? It appears that socket one there has got the output from the oh, where's the amplifier? It's motor drive electronics. This is ground here. So let's see if when I select play. what I believe to be the negative terminal gets connected to ground. No. This terminal gets connected to ground. Grey terminal, which is positive. According to the battery diagram. I need to get the polarity right, don't I? Do this switch here. This is the, the power switch. 
speak to the owner to see if they still have the microphone because it may be that signals are routed through the switches here, the sockets. I know the speaker is apparently integrated into the microphone. It may be that it will not run without the microphone. So uh, I'm going to have to speak to the owner about that and see if it can be found. I wonder why I take on a job. You know, sometimes something simple turns into something complicated. Right, so here's the tape. It's got this pull-through thing. There's a lever on the deck that pulls that through. But it's a weird size, so it won't play on a normal tape deck. So I have to fix this heap of junk. Now, we haven't even managed to work out which way the batteries go yet, but I'm beginning to think... You see, you have to set yourself in the 1960s that everything was back to front in the 1960s. Uh, remember positive earth cars? So this, I think, is a positive earth system. So looking at the schematics, uh, it's rather hard to work out exactly how everything connects up. We calculated that the positive terminal is this one because, look, the battery is positive down there on that label. So this is a positive terminal. Even though it's a grey wire, and the red wire, which I've now extended slightly, goes to the negative terminal. That's just being difficult. So now in the play position, we should find that these terminals on this switch... It's not change over, it's just a make and break switch. That is battery positive there oh and then that goes to ground which the ground terminal is we don't know there we go so it's a positive ground system probably the very black wire that goes to there right let's mark it up so no more confusion a lot more we need to work out because we need to work out where to connect the speaker the problem being that this has a combined speaker and microphone function uh, which plugs into socket here but that socket has multiple pins and we don't even know which is which so there is an issue we need to work out which is the microphone input and which is the speaker output it may be the same terminal they may actually be using a speaker as a microphone BU1 and BU2, so these are the sockets, and one of those is power, so that's BU2, that's going to be power there, and this is going to be our in and out power, and that's going to be in and out here. Let's mark it up. Something here does make a little bit of sense. This is the main switch here, record play switch, and we, we can prove that a little bit with this little bit of circuit here. It tells us that this amplifier can be switched to record or play. So here's the, well, this is the output of the amplifier here. There's a volume control, and this goes out to further amplification. So 9 needs to be connected to 7 or 8, depending if we're in record or play mode. Does that make sense? So in the microphone mode here, according to the diagram, if we're in microphone mode, 9 and 7 are connected together, those two. And if we're in playback mode, 9 and 8 are connected together, those two. So in playback mode, fire will feed out to a speaker, and this must be associated with the speaker microphone switch. Totally clear what this is about, K1 here, and these terminals 2 and 3. We've got 1 two and three I think goes to K1 but we don't know what K1 is. we really need to know this was two key things we need to know now we've worked out the polarity we need to know if there's any kind of switch in the microphone without which the unit won't run and we need to know where the output to the speaker is they're the key things we need to do in order to connect it up to anything so We've ascertained that this 3031 is this switch here, so that's fine. Positive goes to ground, <laughs> lovely. So where does a negative terminal go? Well, it goes via K2 
BU2, but we don't really get a clue as to what that is. That switch there goes out to pin zero. Oh my lord. Switch gear here that's, we don't know what this is doing. But this AC128 is somehow switching the motor on and off. There's some connection between the motor and this switch. That might be an auto stop of some sort. So that these terminals are defined here. Stop or play, 21 is connected to 22. Is connected to 24, wherever they are here. B wind, 20 to 21, fine. And 23 to 25. To work out what we need to do in order to make the motor run and the output from the speaker operate. So this related, that is possibly AC bias. That may be AC bias. These are the capacitors there. So we need to know, are there any control signals for switching on the motor? There might be here. Yes, I believe so. I think 23 to 25 play. 23 to 24 is play because it has to be switched through this pin 6 here. Aha. Uh -huh. 23 to 24. There. Right. So you won't get motor drive without it being switched on from the microphone on BU1 and it's something to do with pin 6. I think we have to ground pin 6 probably. Whereas in fast forward and rewind you want it to work regardless of whether the microphone switch is on. So 23 is bypassed to 25 and grounded there. So we should be able to get it to fast forward and rewind without a microphone. Okay we could test that now. It won't play until this is configured. I think it's one to six probably needs to be grounded in or needs to be connected in order that the the play function will get powered. Right, let's power this up with uh, is it nine volts? Is it six batteries? Right, nine volts, and we should be able to get fast forward and rewind to work. Set my power supply for 9 volts and current limiting at about 2 amps, just under 2 amps. Let's just see if we can get fast forward and rewind to work. So I'm going to load a tape, which I think you put it in there with this fully retracted, and then pull this lever across, and it offers up the tape to this reel. So that's loaded the tape up. This button, by the way, is pause, which won't make any difference to us. So I'll put the cover on that. And then we'll connect up 9 volts here from our power supply. On that side, however weird that feels, with the red wire on this side. Forward. All right, no operation. No current draw. Ground should be plus nine. Let's just measure that. Okay. And we should have so that's through this terminal here that goes through that switch into here. Right. So the ground the negative terminal from the battery goes through this switch. This is somewhat confusing. And to these points. So it goes here, terminal 5, and up here to terminal 20. And terminal 20 in fast forward and rewind will be connected to 21. And that's this big multi-way switch at the front here. 
and that will go through to L1 and L3 in some diodes, but we can't really find them because they haven't labelled very much here. They didn't have any silk screen. There's a counter contact here, which might be something to do with that. Uh, this put this this pulley here. So that might do a rewind to zero type thing. There's a lamp. So there's a light at the very, very front of the unit here. Whether the bulb is still intact, I don't know, but there is a lamp, which will hopefully tell us at least when we're in record. But right now, we need to work out what contacts we need to make in order to get it to function at all. Since in stop and play, 23 and 24 are connected, but in rewind and fast forward, 23 is connected to 25, we know that 23 can be safely grounded. So I'm going to assume that 24 grounds through this terminal 1. So I think 24 goes to pin 6 and is grounded to 1 in play operation. Now, similarly here, uh, these three, uh, we know that in stop and play, 21 and 22 are connected which could go through another switch and 20 in the in fast forward and rewind 20 and 21 are connected but that doesn't ground pin 21 it takes it down to a point here which is not ground but minus so it appears that there's a double pole switch in the microphone, why they chose double pole I don't know, which switches on these two contacts to allow this to power the motor. So all I need to do to bypass that is to ground 23 and set 21 to uh, battery negative minus 9 volts. So I could do that on the back of the socket, but the socket does not is not a sensible wiring. This is not a PCB mount socket. They hadn't thought of such a thing. It's um, just a whole bunch of wires going everywhere. And I'm not sure I want to dig around in there, shorting things out behind this plug. So really, I need a six-pin DIN plug. Well, I don't have one. It's of this variety, because I think there's more than one kind of six-pin, but it's this variety. So you've got kind of two down, two up, two down. And you can still buy plugs of that type. Uh, my question is to myself, do I order a plug-in, which is going to slow us down by several days, or do I try to work out which pin is which? Well, they should be labelled on the back of some of these, or we can find online a diagram that shows what the pin numbering is and short them out with links on the end of here. Or, yes, that would be best, wouldn't it? short them out with links and we can confirm that some of those links will go to other parts we know we should find one of them is connected to ground anyway pin one should be grounded anyway and pin six should go to battery negative anyway at least when uh, a button is pressed for this uh no this one here we don't know what kbu2 is do we Oh dear. This is going to be a switch in the back of BU2, BU2, which ascertains whether or not the plug is plugged in or not. And it's 
battery is only connected when a plug is disconnected, which is sensible. So that contact is made. So we should have a pin on here. If the pin number is correct, we should see pin 5 is battery negative and pin 6 is ground, which is battery positive. Right, let's just do that. So I'd like to get a plug in, but I don't have one, so we'll just have to put wires into here. Now, according to Wikipedia, and I hope it's right, uh, the front side of the socket, uh, which is what we're looking at here, the pins go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, with 6 being the centre one. So we need to connect together, we think. The grounding side, this is the easier one, 24 on here goes to pin 6, which is the centre one, and that needs to be connected to pin 1, which is our ground. So 1 and 6, we think, we need to connect together for the grounding side. which would be across here and then for the other side we think we need to connect oh dear pin zero oh, it all it all looks so good until we hit pin zero and five what's pin zero is that the outer shell Let's firstly see if we're correct about this assumption of which pin is which. So we reckon that pin 1 should be connected to the ground. So by our understanding, pin 1 is over here in the corner. Let's uh, test that, see if it's connected to the ground. So that's valid. And we calculate furthermore that pin 5 should go to the other battery terminal. And pin 5 would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So see if that is the other battery terminal. We were doing quite well until that point. So which is the other battery terminal then? 5, 4, 3, Two, one, that's six. None of them. It is. Switch isn't working. Uh, look at the pinout here then. What kind of pinout is that one? One, two, three, four. That's five pin wide space, I think. Pins, you go one, two, three, four, five on this one. Okay, so we think that the uh, would appear on pin zero of that one, which I presume to be the shell, battery negative. No. Nothing is right, is it? On. Yes, positives at pin one should be negative. Pin 3 should go through to pin 5 of this one. Yes, we agree on that. Now we're getting somewhere. Pin 4 goes off into the circuit. Pin 5 should be 100 ohms to ground. Hundred ohms, yes. So we've correctly identified all these pins. The fact that pin zero doesn't seem to be going to battery minus, nor pin five, this the other one, does not appear to be going to battery minus. It says that the switch on the back of this socket may not be working because. Clearly, 
it's supposed to be made when the power adapter is unplugged. So let's look for the switch on the back of that and uh, fix it. See a switch on it? There's no obvious switch there. That's a transistor, a germanium transistor there. I think this is part of the switch assembly. Yes, there's a switch assembly on this outer edge. I'll need to examine that and find out if it's working to look at it. I know it's not that easy, but uh, this wire here seems to go to a terminal on this side there of the DIN connector. Let's move it around a little bit. And that shorts to ground when... Well, no, sorry, take that back. That shorts to zero, which is the outer shell, when the plug is removed. Only I'm going to guess that that's not working. So if I stick a multimeter down there, I'll find that it's not connected here even though I think it should be. The meter is connected to the outer shell. Here you can see my meter at the bottom. And the other side I'm going to connect to down this piece of tubing. And there is no connection, and I believe there should be, because the plug is removed. So there's a bad switch inside this block here, in there with the what should be grounded or sorry I keep thinking grounded because normally the shell is ground but it's not it's the shell so that's not connected to the shell but I connect bet it's connected to this no or that that terminal is supposed to be oh it's just fallen apart I'm sure that terminal was supposed to be before it fell off connected to, I think, that. So maybe the fact it fell off is part of the problem. Well, I suspect it's more to do with the fact I've disturbed it and it's 60-something years old. But... My question being, is this originally supposed to be push to make or push to break switch? It's a bit hard to tell. Looking at it, that's the other. That's the ter that's the contact there. That corroded bit there is the contact. Push to break. Hey, broken. It has. Just found the other contact. It was inside that sleeving. Anywhere else, that negative terminal only goes there. And I think the point of this is that when you push a plug in, it disconnects the battery because you would want that, wouldn't you? But if I promise to never run it on mains adapter and batteries at the same time, can I bypass that switch and solder this directly to the shell? Yes, let's do that. Shell is also connected to pin three, which is this link here. Okay, so from the shell to pink pin three, that's the out feed here. So I'm going to solder our wire that's come off this faulty switch directly to that point. Battery isolation, uh, battery isolation switch eliminated. Now we can put in on this pin, this plug, the two bypass links we need. That even, we should now be in a position where we can do fast forward and rewind. So let's hook up power and see if fast forward and rewind work now that I've patched out that uh, switch. So here's fast forward and rewind. Connect up 9 volts. It's already re rewound, so let's try fast forward. Well, the motor's running. Mechanically, it's not doing so well. Forward. 
Find. I'd order at the end. Ah. Or if I, no, hang on, which way round is that? That's place, that's fast forward. Ah, try rewind again. Oh dear, I need to rewind the tape. <laughs> I'm assuming that play will not work. Let's just try it though. Correct, play does not work without the microphone. Okay, I have my links in there between one and six and five and zero, the shell, which is uh, a bit lousy. So now I should be able to power it up and get play, I think. Or I'll just have short-circuited something and it's all going to go bang. But we'll have a look. So I press the play button and I'm hoping to see some play. But there's a big gotcha. Since take-up wasn't very good, it didn't do fast-forward. If the take-up spool can't keep up with what's coming off the capstan, I need to switch it off quickly or it'll mangle the tape. Can I get it so that you can see it like that? All right, power it up and let's see if it tries to play. Be ready to stop. It's playing. When I hit stop, everything's fine. Fast forward, I think it was too slow, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. And rewind is fine, I think. Oh, it's come to the end, so it's not right, it's rewinding. It's apparently working. We need to go back to the schematics to work out where we can pick up from this socket the audio out. This could all go terribly wrong, of course, because these capacitors might be in a terrible state. But uh, let's just see if we can pick up something, even if it's distorted noise. So the output from the amplifier, this is clearly push-pull transistor here, a uh, transformer arrangement here. So the output is coming on these switches 4, 5 and 10. Uh, I see 1 and 4, so that's what 1's about. 1 is an input in the microphone condition, is connected to 4. So that's the speaker terminal, I reckon. And in the that's in the record position. And in the play con condition, I'm guessing two are connected, so one A1 is. Is that the head? head? Of course it is. For the playback condition, we need to find out which terminal goes out to the, uh, the... I think it's combined speaker and microphone. And I think the output of the power amplifier comes out on, pin, on switch 5, which in play condition goes to 4, and out to our... Uh, DIN connector on its pin 4. So between 1 and 4 I should have audio, though I definitely want to put it through a um, DC blocking capacitor. Right, I've now connected the input to my digital audio recorder between pins 1, which is also linked through to pin 6 on my chart here, uh, and pin 4, which is that one, because go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 5, remember, is also connected to the pin 0, the outer shell. Uh, and we've got that going through a 0.22 microfarad capacitor just to block any DC, not blow up my digital audio recorder. Uh, when I get a, some DIN plugs in, which I've ordered, it'll obviously be a much tidier job. But right now, we just want to see if we get anything. So uh, I can put this digital audio recorder on. Not sure if it's actually going to reflect the sound out to the speaker. Speaker on, but I'm not sure if it does. Well, we'll find out in a minute. If we see anything on the VU meters, then we can monitor what we get. So I'll just start that recording anyway. Record level may be all wrong. Volume level on this would be too high because we're connecting to... Uh, speaker outlet to a line in so that's obviously not good but uh, hopefully it's just enough that we can see if anything works so switch on the power supply and press play and we've got way too much audio level we can see that right away I've turned the volume to minimum and we are recording something. 
Should we stop that? And see if we have anything on our playback. It'd be better if we could monitor it, wouldn't it? Okay. So we can pick up a lot of motor noise. And what else? The speed is wrong, and there's a lot of wear and flutter to the start. I've taken the motor voltage down to 9 volts because I was running on about 9.3 before. I think that's just trying to fall off. Come on. Yep, good. Got that. So it seems to me that there's, there's probably a servo motor and the servo is not working. Well, that's what you'd think in modern day. But the speed controls are just way off. Oh well, let's record whatever it is that's on this tape. At whatever speed and with however much wear and flutter it wants to do. We could even hit a content match, couldn't we? That's an old song, Grandad. Okay, I'll just let the tape run. At least we will catch everything that's on the tape. You can hear some faint background noises which very much imply that that was recorded with a microphone shut, uh, placed in front of a record player or similar. I wonder if my shorting out these links is the reason for the wrong speed. It could be that the microphone has a speed control on it so I'm running it flat out because of those links and really it needs a resistor in one or the other of those links. Well there's clearly nothing on this more than that song on this side of the tape. So I'll flip the tape over. Can I fast forward to the end? Or is it fast forward that doesn't work? Fast forward's working. Oh look! That's turning. What's it telling us? I don't know why that's turning and the numbers are going past. So I think that's a resettable counter, that's what that is. Okay, so that's not relevant to speed. Struggling a little bit at the very end of the tape there. Let's turn the tape over. Set it into record again, press play again, and let's see what we get. There's something on there. I'll leave that running. Whatever the speed correction is for that song, we could apply it to any uh, voice recordings we find on the tape. OK, I've been able to recover the customer's audio. I have a theory that the reason that the music was so warbled is that that was recorded when it had the elastic bands in it. Because my impression of the speech audio on the other side of the tape. Okay, granted speech doesn't show brown flutter so much, but my impression is that it's fine. So I think that uh, that recording was fine. But we still have the problem with the speed. Now, if my theories are right, uh, we should be able to hit record and see it play much slower than it was playing with these links in in playback mode. Uh, so let's just have a quick look at that, see if that makes any sense. So, go into play. No, oh, play's not working. Have I dropped a wire? Yes. Oh! It's now playing at what I think is the right speed.
Right. So there's something going on with these connections. What I really need is some proper DIN plugs. Well, I ordered some on eBay, and I have to say a big thank you to this eBay seller who got these things to me. I ordered these 3 p.m. yesterday, and they arrived this morning. Brilliant. So we have what I hope is oops, the DIN plug for power and DIN plug for uh, audio. Right, let's see if they fit first. So it's a five pin uh, wide space, as I call it, 240 degree. Let's see if that fits there. Good. So we can connect that up to my uh, a connector that I can give power to it. Right, that's really good. That's better than this mucking about with the battery terminals. I will put a label on the battery hatch to the effect that batteries must not be installed while the mains adapter is plugged in since the uh, battery isolator switch has expired. And then this then is the connector for audio. So this is the bump. So one to six are linked and one also goes to the speaker. And then we have five and zero, the outer connection, are linked. And the speaker is going to four. Can we try to work out which was the connection I was either making or not making properly that was causing that speed error? Because I was wiggling it and jiggling it just now. So let's put the power on. Yeah, I think it's the... 1 to 6 connection that is causing the speed differences. So let's check that. We make a good connection on 1 to 6 and if 1 to 6 should be removed, let's actually try that first. Should it be in or out? If I take 1 to 6 away, does it go faster or slower? It goes slower. Okay, so 1 to 6 is speeding it up. Ah, the 1 to 6 connection should not be in place. All right then, that's fine. So I won't put that link in. That makes it go faster. We don't want that. So we just want the five to zero and one to four for the speaker. Right, I'll um, make that up. These DIN plugs unfortunately don't have the uh, pin numbers marked on the back or front. No, that's a little unfortunate. So I'll just have to use a bit of common sense. Okay, I've wired up the audio connector and as we discussed, I've removed the link that made it run very fast, which was the one from pins 1 to 6. Uh, can we maybe look at the schematic and try to work out why that made it run fast? So the 1 to 6 connection is connecting this switch pin 24 to ground, which is the same as it is connected to in the record mode. So connecting 1 to 6 during play had the effect of making the same connection to ground here that the switch does when it's in the 23 to 25 in a fast forward and rewind position. So it made the motor run in play at the fast forward speed. Okay, so that's not a fault, but it was obviously a switch or deliberate um, either a switch or maybe a control that's inside the microphone for high-speed playback, which is quite typical of the sort of thing you'd get on a dictation machine. So it's correct to uh, leave that one out. But the, switch, the, the connection I made here between 5 and 0 on this connector uh, does do what is required here of bridging that switch um, in the play position, uh, which allows the motor to run at all. So good, we've got the wiring correct, I reckon, in this. And that's just um, straight out to the connector for the digital audio recorder. It's got the 0.22 microfarad capacitor in there as a DC blocking capacitor, just to be on the safe side. I'll test it in a moment. But first I want to sort out power. So we have the power connector, hopefully that fits too. Yes, good. So that's on BU two so clearly positive is pin one and 
we've had to bypass this um, battery isolation switch. So um, negative is on pin zero. Okay, so they're the only two connections we need on here. So this switch here is the one that uh, detects when any key is pressed. For some reason we have the option of bypassing that on the power connector, but I can't think why I'd want to do that. Right, so I'm going to make up a cable with the DIN plug at one end for this and a female DC power connector at the other end, so I can run this off a normal mains adapter. Okay, I've got it all hooked up with my uh, DIN connectors and labels, you see, like that. Um, if you've got a brain the size of a planet, like uh, Carson of Carson's Labs, you don't have to label anything. But when you're stupid like me, you do. So uh, I've labelled that and I've labelled what these cables are, so in the future I don't get confused. And now it's running at the right speed, I'll redo that transfer for the customer. Sometimes we might even be lucky and hit it first time. But in the main, quite a number of adjustments are going to be made. Before, before we're... That's working quite well, and I've been really lucky that the capacitors seem to be okay in this, and indeed the uh, germanium transistors. Uh, it would probably benefit from fresh capacitors, but uh, it's working well enough for a dictation machine as it stands. Quite pleased with that. But you have to wonder, what was the problem this thing was trying to solve? You know, this idea here... There's no water stop in Rewind, but the idea is that it's easy load, yes? Uh, when it doesn't do what it just did and gets stuck, it's supposed to be easy load. You're supposed to be able to just... Uh, <laughs> you see, that, that didn't go right, right then. That's supposed to go into there in Rewind. So the, the idea is that this is nice and easy. You can just pop them in and press the uh, auto load lever here, or pull the auto load lever, and then select play and it will auto load. And yeah, that works. Uh, but wouldn't it have been easier to have not bothered with any of that? There we are, rewound properly that time. Not bother with separating the two halves of the tape out. Why don't you sort of bring them together into one plastic housing, Phillips? You know, you can uh, come up with some ideas along that line, surely. Well, like that one. Well, no, it's a little bit too big. Those, uh, no, maybe a little bit too small. There you go. Perfect. That's what they were heading towards. They should just have done that instead of having these two separate reels. And now this thing can go back into its uh, typically fashionable of the time uh, leatherette case, which uh, I think is supposed to have a seam along the back edge there, so it would just flip open and you can use it in the case if you want to. I guess we could uh, put some kind of tape along there to uh, put it back together. And it has a small window there. You can just about see how much tape is left on the reel. So this isn't a solution looking for a problem, right? There was a problem that loading open reel audio tapes was too fiddly. But this wasn't a good solution. Uh, it just made life more complicated. So before we put this away and forget it ever existed, perhaps we should have a little bit of a think about how technologically important uh, and important to history this tape recorder might have been. Because thinking about it, I think it was really important. Now, the cartridge in here didn't have a great name. It was called EL3779. So it wasn't a very catchy name, was it? And that's what the format was called, it seems. Uh, now, okay, it solved one of the problems of open reel tapes in that it auto-loaded. You could just load from one side to the other without having to fiddle about with the reels. That was clever, but it didn't solve the problem that you could not you could not take out the tape halfway through and flip it over. Now, the tape in this, I was having that think, wasn't I? Oh, what's the size of the tape? And I could tell it was more than a quarter inch. But it actually seems to be probably the same as audio cassette. It looks very slightly narrower to me, but that could just be manufacturing tolerances. 
so I believe it's the same size tape, 0 0.15 inches, not an eighth, which is 3.81 millimeters. Okay, so we've got a system here which uses probably the same size tape as audio cassette. We don't know what speed it runs at, but I've certainly seen one reference that said it runs at 1 and 7 8 inches per second, the same as audio cassette. We don't know how the tracks are laid out, but it's unlikely they're any different to audio cassette. I bet that you could play that tape physically on the machine that plays these. However, I don't think you could actually just put that tape in a cassette because the hub on that's very much larger than the tiny little hub inside an audio cassette. This tape is designed to be wound on such a small hub. It's a very thin uh, tape base uh, and backing, whereas this is, certainly feels to the touch much thicker. Feels a little bit more like uh, open reel audio tape. So I don't think it would appreciate being wound tight on that spool. Uh, it would probably damage the tape. What you could potentially play it on was that nightmare thing that uh, Techmoan covered a little while ago, the RCA uh, Real Media Center, which had a sort of open reel tape recorder, which is really just a modified cassette deck, and took cassette-sized tape on spools. So if you loaded some tape on the end of this, uh, gash tape or leader tape, so that it could reach the spool and you didn't miss out a load, you could then put that onto a reel put it in that awful RCA media thing and it would play it if it's the same speed and if there's the same track configuration it would play it properly. Uh, now that would probably give better results than this as well because we did have a bit of a problem with motor noise on this though on the rerun I did when the motor was slower I think it was within acceptable limits uh, but it's still potentially with more modern electronics than this has would have played back better than this. So maybe that wasn't the first um, open reel cassette tape size format. It was actually preceded by this from about 1960. Audio cassette came along in around about 1963, though of course it became much more popular later. And it could well be then that this little tape recorder actually was really important for the future of uh, audio technology. Bear in mind, Autocassette was designed initially as, like this, a dictation machine. It developed into hi-fi audio much later on. So, actually, much better than we thought it was. I'll do plenty more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now.